Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Hamdan Al Shamsi Lawyers and Legal Consultants Workshop, being held at the Youth Hub at Emirates Towers. My name is Jasmine Bernard, and I'm the Business Development Manager at Hamdan Al Shamsi Lawyers and Legal Consultants. Today, we will be discussing the latest on Space Sector Two, being led by Ms. Helen Tung from Hamdan Al Shamsi Lawyers, who will be leading today's workshop. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. I will now introduce you over to Helen, who's going to be discussing the innovating updates on space and answering all your questions in relation to today's topic. Thank you very much. Over to you, Helen. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jasmine, for having me. So, um, I mean, where do we start with space? Uh, so yesterday we heard from the UAE Space Agency about the recent developments in relation to Hope Probe, uh, the legislation that's come out, um, the national space policy, and I think it gave a very good overview on what's actually happening in relation to space. Um, I guess a bit about myself, as you know, you know, I'm a lawyer and you know, working with the DIFC team. Um, at the same time, I work with startups, <laughs> and hence my interest and background in that field. Um, I guess uh, space is a very, particularly in the UAE, it's a very exciting period right now because it's, it's you know, green fields, it's open door, and anyone and everyone who has an interest really, you know, has a possible stake in this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Today we wanted to discuss with you UAE space startups, yes. funding options, obviously the conference, International Aeronautical Congress. So we do have a few questions for you Great. that have been sent in, in advance. Okay. So the first topic that we'll start with is what is a space startup? Okay, that's a very good question. So most people have heard of the word startup from Silicon Valley, you know, from you know their own hubs, as it were, accelerator programs. Um, Space startup is no different from any other startup. Uh, I think people usually get the impression that if I do a particular kind of business, I can't get involved in space. But actually, um, I would take it a step further and say space touches upon um, across all sectors if you can see it happening. So I'll give you a very simple example. Um, usually when we talk about space, we think of outer space. So we think of things that are like higher up. But um, as simple as our mobile phones have a chip in it, and that chip is linked to a satellite. So already, if you can envisage that startup, if you're dealing with chips, you're dealing with phones, it's actually potentially a space startup. So um, I think in terms of defining a space startup is anyone can be a space startup if they think creatively outside the box. So I'd like to share with you, um, a few years ago, I was training entrepreneurs in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, funded by the Swiss government. And I had, um, so I was a bit like in, um, acting as an investor. And so startups would come to me, they would have a one hour slot with me, and they would pitch to me about their startup, um, what they're doing, and what they need for their, for their business. And some of them would say, Oh, I'm a former footballer, I have this mes muscle measuring app, um, you know, this is what I'm looking for. So the question I ask at the end of whatever they've just said is, And how about space? And their response would be, no, 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 I don't, I don't do space, right? I, I do this, I do that, but I don't do space. I go, well, think about it. You're doing a muscle measuring app. Astronauts need it. Um, in human space flight, we all need it because we, you know, once you're up in space, you know, we lose, you know, muscle density because of gravity and everyone needs to exercise twice a day or two hours a day or something like that. So for a start, it occurred to him that maybe, yes, I could possibly do space. I have another startup and they s allegedly say, we sell the best water, you know, natural drinking water. Like you can come to Dubai and see the whole, whole wad of uh, water, right? So I asked the exact same question. Well, how about space? And they go, no, 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 we don't, we don't do space. And I said, well, we need to drink water, don't we, when we go to space? Well, there's a different story to that. But, but think of it for a moment. We need to eat, we need to drink. And so that's where I think rather than making space an impossible dream, we bring space to Earth <laughs> and just envisage if you can do this on Earth, you can do this in space. So, so if you were to ask me what is a space startup, yes, you've got the technical, you know, physical space startups up in space, but I think there are a lot of startups that do things that could also be applied in space. Yeah, yeah that's amazing because Thank when you. you look at it on the the greater circle and when you break yeah. it down like that I think one of these these workshops will be able to show people mm. that actually space can come envisioned into any startup yes if you really think about it yeah. and when you take it out on the greater scale so that's yeah. fantastic yeah. okay another question is 
what is the space startup scene in the UAE and also globally? Okay. Like what is happening out there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, a good starting point is the UAE. Um, as mentioned earlier, it's a very exciting time right now. Um, if we look at a few years ago, what the vision was for the UAE was to get 10 satellites up in space um, with a $20 billion investment, which is no, you know, pennies as it were. It's a lot of money. And of course, when we talk about you know, space startup scene. We, we look at the startups, obviously, the entrepreneurs, the individuals themselves. And I like the idea of starting young because I think that's where our thinking is not prohibited or blocked by, you know, realistic constraints. You know, when you're, you know, a 10-year-old, 15-year-old, 18-year-old, where you're just about to embark on university, you want to think about, well, what do I want to do? And that's why it's so great to be at the Youth Hub as well because this is the place where all the young people would come, brainstorm ideas and whatnot. And then you've got, the whole spectrum, right? So you've got that, you've got education, then you've got the investors. So for me, um, having spent some time in Silicon Valley, I would say there are two kinds of investors. So you've got the very traditional investment upon return kind of investor, which better or worse in the UAE is very realistic. And, and I would say their majority, that kind of investor. And then you've got the strategic investor who I would say Silicon Valley is the best place to be because they would fund you from the very outset from your ideas. So I've met people who literally on a napkin would brainstorm their ideas and get invested on that. So I think um, in terms of the startup scene, um, UAE is great if you've got a product ready to go to the market. If you've got a very preliminary idea, it's not to say you won't get anywhere, but I would say it's better to have that formulated beforehand. Mm -hmm. However, at the same time, I think that's sl slowly changing by the scenes of here um, in Abu Dhabi, there's Hub 71 where the UAE Space Agency is actually working very closely um, with the Accelerator Program to get startups into the UAE. So I think that's um, very good. Which other country do you want to talk about? Like, uh, um, I don't or, or know. So, I think yeah. when we said globally, I mean, yeah. obviously we know that America has a very big presence yes. in terms of in terms of yes. space. So, yeah. how do you think it compares in terms to the UAE versus what's happening with America oh, okay. at the moment? Yes. And how do they gel together? Are they working together, yes. or are they working as two separate yes. entities? Yeah, yeah. So, um, of course, America, Russia, in fact, um, they are the I guess key players in space. Mm -hmm. Um, you could say disproportionately, they have the most astronauts that have gone to space. Um, they've got the oldest, you could say, you know, know-how and technology, and particularly um, Russia, former USSR, in terms of space launch. Um, having said that, there are a lot of exciting developments for younger countries, albeit countries that have new space agencies. So I'm going to mention, for example, New Zealand. They're very um, interesting, exciting. Um, you've got countries like South Africa. You've got... Um, you know, of course, Canada as well, it's huge. UK has always had it, but more so because of Brexit, for better or worse. They've really had to put in money to sort of rethink their own space strategy, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, I think the European Union overall has a wonderful um, setup, only, well, I say only, but because they have their own research centers um, and because they've got their own field of expertise, um, I guess I could mention um, in the European Space Agency, they have got um, what they call incubation centers. They've over, I think, 30 to 40 of them around Europe. Um, I visited a few and they've run really efficiently, run very well. Um, their thinking is slightly different from the UAE. So their thinking is between US, which I would say they would invest on a napkin, to the UAE, which is more conservative, go to market, how much can you sell? You've got um, Europe, which is a bit more, I think, a balance, which I would say they have a great idea, but they've also got a business plan. And they've got investors who would not necessarily invest as heavily or crazily as the US, but they have enough to get the startup going. So I think in, in some ways, I think the the, EU, uh, the EU model would probably be the safe bet between the two. Mm. Um, Japan is also an interesting one because I was in Japan to try and help, um, what well, was funded by the European Commission, but also the Japan Ministry of Finance, to try and help them double the space sector. So on a conceptual level, how do you do that, right? And so for me, it's more the mental blocks that maybe young people, the policy makers have, and even the investors. So investors who would traditionally not even look at a particular model, mm. you know, because um, how can I describe it? Um, I know Japanese culture quite well because of my previous experience and having studied the language is that they're more conservative, yet ironically, they're also very keen on investing in technology. So SoftBank is a very good example of... Um, you know, investing in innovative ideas, but their way of doing things in terms of the culture itself is very traditional. So it's interesting to see because you've got this um, 
uh, change in dynamics, I would say. And Luxembourg, I have to mention Luxembourg. Um, I would say Luxembourg is very innovative because it is a landlocked country, because it's one of the smallest country, one of the wealthiest, they've had to really crack open and think outside of the box. So them in America, they've launched the new space laws, uh, commercial laws, which allows for space companies, whoever goes up to space and mines an asteroid or gets materials, if they bring it back to Earth, it's theirs. Now, it's unheard of, right? Because we've got public international laws which say, no state owns anything, pretty much. Like whatever you bring back to Earth, it's for the, the well-being of humanity or you know, for, the, for, for humankind, as it were. But I think Luxembourg has, has done it right in the sense that they've moved quickly. <laughs> they didn't go through the traditional route of let's talk to European Parliament about this, let's just do it. And so what's happened with them is obviously they've got investors interested and they've man managed to get a lot of startups set up in Luxembourg. So I think when you look across in the UAE, what's happened is that's what they're trying to achieve. So in the Middle East, I think the UAE is trying to position itself as being the place to be. And so it'll be interesting to see actually how it, how it fares, you know, long yeah, term. Definitely. Yeah. So the message as well is that yeah. pretty much if you want to get involved in space, yeah. and startups and just even general information on space every country has mm. some form of way in which you can get involved yes. which is really good yeah. and then i think another message that i got from you as well was that it's a really good idea at the moment to get the youths and young people involved in space and this yes. whole idea from an early age yes. obviously there's so many different aspects there's space laws in terms of which we work on at the moment yes. because of you know the legal aspects as lawyers there's entrepreneurs there's startups there's investors yes. so many people yes. can get involved in it at the moment but i yeah. think also at the moment and the really great thing that the UAE is doing now is raising that awareness yes. because as you said there's investors that maybe have never even thought about it so they're yes. already you know entrepreneurs already have made their money and now everyone's kind of getting that awareness of space and getting young people and investors and pretty much everybody saying that you know you can actually be a part of this yes. which is fantastic it's brilliant yeah. okay so um, the next question would be which obviously is going to be put out to a lot of people who are interested now mm. is how do we get started you know yeah. if I want to get involved in a space startup yes. where do I start where do I begin yeah yeah so um, uh, maybe I could use myself as an example <laughs> so I actually got into space by you could say by accident I always talk about how space came to me and not the other way around although I do appreciate you know the stars and the galaxies and all that but I was working as a barrister in a very traditional setting in London, going to court day in, day out. And this goes back to our purpose. You know, what is it that you want to do? And as a young, I, I, I go back to the, you know, the ideal candidate or the ideal client being, you know, the young 10 to 18 year old who is trying to figure out what they want to do with their life. Um, seemingly, you know, you've got the parents who tell you what you want to do and then you've got you know, everyone else advising you, but really at the end of the day, you've got to figure out what you want to do. So I had to take a step back in my career because I had to reflect, do I want to do this, i.e. go in court, in and out, for day in, day out for the rest of my life? And it occurred to me, well, is this the kind of impact I want in life? So you do the maths, right? So if I go to court, I represent one client a day, I go for 365 days, that is the impact I'm having. And I'm like, is that it? And you could say it's a quarter life crisis. And I thought, there must be more to life. There must be more to life. So I actually took... Um, some time out and I went back to Australia and then I start brainstorming thinking and there was an opportunity I attended Singularity University so I spent three months at NASA I had no proper intention of doing anything space related even then believe yeah. it or not but what I did do was I was open to the idea of attending conferences sessions so I remember there was a weekend session the conference was water on the moon it's not so simple, right? When, you went to, when I went to the conference, they were talking formulas, they were talking a language. I had no idea what they were talking about. And I sat there going, right, this is about water on the moon. I have no idea what it's about. But what intrigued me was there are obviously people working on this. Mm. And you think about if there's water, there's opportunity to survive. Right? Like we talk about if you, if you don't eat food for two weeks, but if you drink water, you can survive. Yeah. So the fascination about water on the moon was that if there's water on the moon, then we can survive out there. So, so that was more intrigued me, not the technical, you know, you know, CO2 and whatnot. And so from there on, I then met, bumped into two guys. Uh, one was actually a rocket scientist. One was a, a guy working on scalable electric, uh, electric vehicles. And we start talking and we said, yeah, let's do it. So we decided to co-found a satellite propulsion startup. And I have to confess at that time, I knew nothing about it. But I did the deep dive as a lawyer would, you know, you read your CV, you know, civil procedure rules, yeah. you read everything you can about the technology. And we started it. We started pitching investors within eight months. 
less than that, actually, I think four or five months. Um, we went to Luxembourg, we pitched, we won first prize, and we won about almost half a million euros with the European Space Agency, which is set up in Luxembourg. Amazing. Now, there is a turn to this story, which is even more shocking. So as I was um, planning to meet as many customers as I could in LA, as you imagine, SpaceX, Virgin Orbit, you know, um, Aerospace Corporation, you name it, my co-founder called me up. We have a regular team meetings. And two weeks before setting up in Luxembourg, he goes, Helen, we can't do this. I said, what? What do you mean? He goes, oh, because of cultural reasons. Some, sorry to put this lame excuse. I meditated on it and I thought, wow, if a rocket scientist can't do space, then we're all doomed, honestly. I'm a lawyer trying to do space, right? But what it allowed me to realize was the problem is not even a problem. It's not a real tangible problem. The problem is all up here. Can I do it? Can't I do it? If you say you can, you can. I mean, this is like really typical Tony Robbins speech, right? Yeah. If you think you can't do it, you can't do it. And that was what brought me to the journey of going out there, talking to young people, talking to entrepreneurs, because then it all made sense. This idea of space, yeah, let's just bring it down to earth for a second. We were on the moon 50 years ago. Why have we not gone back? And my theory is because we left it to the scientists, because all scientists think of is, let's do R&D, let's do R&D. They never think about, wait a second, how can we actually create an e-commerce platform? How can we do business? How can we actually make mm -hmm. going to space and the moon a viable option, yeah. right? So it started making me realize that we need more than just scientists working on the moon or space. We need everyone involved, policymakers, young people, you and me, everyone involved to make it easier. So I, I look at it this way, yeah? So um, the closest thing between actually going to outer space and traveling is Virgin Galactics. You know, it, you know, I don't want to say interstellar travel, but let's just say, let's just do a loop. Yeah, let's just do a loop, go to outer space and come back, I don't know, for a few hours. Let's say the ticket for that, and I actually met a lady selling those tickets, is, um, let's say 200,000 a ticket. Let's just, just argument say, okay? Let's bring that cost down. If you buy a ticket, I buy a ticket, you know, in the same way that, you know, flight tickets used to be very expensive. Let's make it 20,000 a ticket. And then with more and more people interested, it becomes $2,000 a ticket. So you see, the more people that are involved in the business, the cost goes down. And I think it's the same thing with mobile phones. It's the same thing with um, laptops. So we shouldn't be shocked by a new idea and by the price tag initially. We need to think of a, how can we bring that price down and accessible. So where and how do we start? You can start today. I mean, let's just keep it simple. Let's, let's from whether you're a student, whether you're a scientist, whether you're you know, even a lawyer, right? I've been trying to advocate lawyers to get more in, involved and interested, and they look at me with a horror. <laughs> what? But actually, I think you start from where you're, you're at. You don't need to you know, develop wings and suddenly go and study aeronautical sciences, which I actually did, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I actually did. So to, to, to give you a full view of what happened to me, was my plane ticket from LA to Luxembourg was actually via London. So because I was only given two weeks notice, I had no plan B, right? I, I went from the bar thinking, great, I'm gonna do this startup as legal counsel, co-founder, whatever. So I did my best. I called up all my contacts in London saying, I'm back in town, do you have any cases for me? And I filled up my diary with three months worth of cases. So I literally, I landed on the Sunday and Monday I was back at Manchester County Court battling it out, you know, for another three months. And obviously I was a bit cheesed off as it were, but my dream never stopped. So um, a wonderful mentor, a wonderful chap called Gary Martin, who used to be the former head of directorship, uh, directors at NASA, mm -hmm. Gave me a call and we start talking and he goes, Helen, why don't you apply for ISU? ISU is International Space University. So there were two thoughts that came to my mind. I thought, ISU, I mean, firstly, they're all engineers. And secondly, the, co the courses are expensive. But anyway, I, I sort of mulled over it a bit. And then another guy said, why don't you apply for us? I applied. It's a summer course. It's a very intensive course doing space engineering, aeronautical, everything you just cannot imagine, right? And I got accepted, and not just that, I got a scholarship from ESA, which paid for everything that I had personally paid for the startup, to, you know, to start up, which is about 10 grand, right? And I went there, and in the same way where I sat in the, you know, water on the moon scenario, I had no idea what they were talking about. And I'm not joking, you right? You, you see this going around, what do you call that? Epogee, okay? When the planet moves over. 
I did that for three months. I sat there like a good student and surprisingly, believe it or not, we had exams as well. I passed B plus, And what I can say to people is I don't know everything, but what I can say is I know a little bit. And that gives the client, the customer comfort, particularly the aerospace companies comfort that it's not just a lawyer blagging their way in. It's a lawyer who knows a little bit of what we're talking about. Yes. And one of the comforting things, which I'll share as well, just to give you an idea, is how does this, how does this translate into everyday business? So I was at a space conference where I was talking in, in Silicon Valley. And a Japanese company, they're one of the biggest aerospace companies, they contacted me and they said, Helen, oh, well, I'd love to have a chat with you. So I go, okay, fine. I did all the research you can imagine over a weekend about this particular space company and their propulsion systems. And so I was ready for that meeting with the pitch deck and everything. And it was not one guy, one engineer. It was five of them. And they're the experts, by the way. <laughs> so we have a half an hour meeting. I'm talking, to, I'm talking their language, yeah? So it's not legalese, it's engineering legalese. And at the end of it, he said to me, Helen, we like what you're doing. Show us your prototype. Maybe we can do business. And that sense of, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's different from talking to a lawyer. When a lawyer says, okay, I'll give you work, blah, blah, blah. It's because you're trained, you know what you're doing. But when an engineer talks to you and says, okay, we, you sound like someone who knows what they're talking. That sense of... Um, relief, that sense of comfort and sense of, wow, we can do it. Yeah, you know, I'm, and I'm also thinking, that they believe yeah, in you as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think for me, what I'm trying to say is if I can do it, anyone can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not putting it at its highest. I'm just saying, look, we put a bit of effort in there, try and learn people's language, try and get your head around the subject. Mm -hmm. And the rest is, you know, and history. Have a passion for yeah, it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a lovely story. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll go on to the next question. Thank you so much for that story, Helen. It's absolutely amazing yeah. and um, really inspiring as well. So the next question we have is, what things do I need to consider if I want to start up in the UAE or globally? For example, Japan, UK or USA, and okay. if you can provide some comparisons. Yes, sure, sure. So if we start with the UAE, so obviously there's the onshore jurisdiction and offshore jurisdiction, so like DIFC or on um, the UAE local laws. Um, what I would say is obviously it really depends on what you're aiming for, what you're going for. Um, to give you an example, um, I, because I worked in Japan, setting it in Japan, obviously, you know, the language is very important. So in the UAE, it will be English and Arabic. Um, you need to think about your customers. Space is international, so it actually doesn't really matter in the sense of um, where you're based. However, Uh, looking at your what you're offering, looking at the competitors is really important. So to give an example, America is already, already a very saturated market. So if you're going to go to America with your wonderful idea, you need to be really above the competition in a unique selling point. Whereas in the UAE, it's a younger market. So what you're about to offer is probably you know, going to be taken with a bit more interest. It might be harder in the long term getting investment earlier stage, but in the long term in terms of customers, you might have a lot of scope. Um, Uh, for example, I know one Japanese startup, they're doing um, ground systems, for instance, and what they need, in fact, they've already come to the UAE, um, is they need space. Um, literally, they need land like the desert and all that. So the UAE is perfect to set up their operations, but in terms of their headquarters, because they are a Japanese company, that's where they are. There is one startup I know, um, they do space debris recycling. So they've got stuff all over the world. They chose Singapore. So Singapore as a headquarters, subsidiary in Japan, uh, one arm in the UK and one arm in America. So they're an international startup, which is amazing from the, the get-go, right? And particularly now with COVID-19, I think people, if they're bringing their friends together, if they're getting people together, they can really think, how can I launch and be an international startup from day one? Because mm. one of the challenges is I've, that I've seen, and probably for, from a selfish point of view as a lawyer, is if you start from a very narrow mindset and say, okay, I'm just going to set up here and that's it. Once you try to expand globally, you're not you're having to force yourself to think, for example, HR, right? Thinking about employment contracts and all this kind of stuff. But from day one, if you talk to a firm or find advisors who already have that international mindset mm -hmm. to help you out, then you're in a much better place in the long term because then you won't be drafting and redrafting contracts and, yeah. you know, fighting over little clauses because you already thought about if there's any problem, who and how will we deal with it? So um, things I want to consider is that, so you want to think about your team, where they're located, time zones are really important. So the previous startup I was telling, well, it was a 
stretch. It was either 5 a.m., 6 a.m., or around the midnight, you know, 11, 10 p.m. So you want to be in a similar time zone, whilst you want to be international, that you can work together and actually, you know, have sensible hours, working hours. Um, In terms of, you want to think about what scope you want to be in. Of course, you might just say, I have my office, but I'm going to have agents, in which Mm -hmm. case, you know, that's fine, that's flexible. So you want to think about your customers and competitors because that's going to shape how you want to set up. So another good example is one startup that I knew of, they didn't want to go to France or America because it was a saturated market. So they chose the UK. And particularly with Brexit, there's a lot of incentive and the government's actually offering a lot of money for those that are interested to also look and consider in the UK because there's obviously a lot of need, so, you know, needs for goods and services. So so I would say what you'd want to do short of you know you you're talking to your mum and dad and everyone else is, is actually talk to people advisors get as much information um, and then you know this is a this is a good selling point right? as lawyers we don't say come to us when you have a problem come to us at the beginning so we can help you through your journey so that's what I would um, I would say yeah, okay, yeah. fantastic it's brilliant advice and in terms of people wanting to get involved, what activities can people get involved sure, in at the sure. here and the now? Okay, so um, so as I said before, I sort of stumbled into space. Is um, There's an organization called Space Generation Advisory Council. It's usually between, I think, teens to about 35, which I would highly recommend anyone interested in space to join. It's surprisingly very well established and all your future you know, CEOs in space are coming from this branch of um, SJAC. So I was part of the law and policy group and um, you've got some people who are actually at university doing PhDs in you know the workplace um, but it's a wonderful network of people. Generally the, the one sole <laughs> common interest is interest in space. That's it, right? So you could be an astrobiologist, you could be you know interested in you know astrophysics, you could be interested in plants, whatever, but space is the central talking point and it was through SJAC that I was able to join as a delegate to attend you know the higher level meetings at the UN for instance the United Nations Office of Outer Space and it's actually quite common because SJAC is so well respected and because most of them end up doing startups and then become CEOs or CTOs and whatnot of different space organizations that you really could feel um, you know, you you yourself or seeing others working through the ranks, as it were. So that's one of them. The other, which I'm also part of, is called the International Aeronautical Congress. It's an annual conference. In fact, this year it was supposed to be held in Dubai, but because of COVID-19, they've decided to make it online. And so next year it's going to come to town. You get about 7,000 attendees and huge, all the space companies, all the space agencies. So you've got the Boeings, the SpaceX, you know, the Virgin Galactics, everyone coming to one place, which is an amazing buzz, you know. Um, Last year, um, we had some great speakers. We had Jeff Bezos speak from Amazon, you know, because of Blue Origin. Um, You had like the vice president, you know, coming to speak, you know, and it was it was a real buzz. So you've got the whole format formality. If you're on the business side, you're an investor, or be it you're a startup or just a student even just interested to get your head in this is the conference you want to attend, and we're going to show a video later on. And the other thing I want to say is, it's never it's never too late, and it's never too hard. I think yeah. these are the two things I want to say, like from the get go. If and I use myself as an example, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Is literally the barrier is either up here, or if people the naysayers who say, look, you know, you got to just give yourself some years. You go no. <laughs> as a startup, you have to you know, believe in yourself first and foremost and say, I can do it. I just need to figure out how to do it. And I just need to figure out, in fact, I think I read somewhere, um, this is a a Texan millionaire long time ago, saying something like, well, all you need to do is just figure out how much does it cost and how I'm going to pay for it, right? So if it's going to cost you time, do some studying. If if it means you need to do some research, do it after hours, you know, after work, you know. Um, You know, if it means, you know, getting the right connections, well, pick up the phone, talk to someone, you know. So I think... There are all these possibilities, and so I would say start early, start young, you know, um, and and you'll be fine. Um, in terms of organisations, I would say start locally. So maybe do some research what's happening in your country. So for example, since the launch of the Australian Space Agency, New Zealand Space Agency, and now with like say the UK, there are so many opportunities. Um, in fact, the barrier is far shorter than you might imagine. Um, Having said that, you will meet people, um, it's not a criticism, it's an observation, um, who have worked in European Space Agency, NASA, 
for years. I'm talking 20, 30 years. So when they see a fresh face, <laughs> like myself, like others, they might be a bit like, hmm, well, what are you doing here? So you need to offer what you've got. So what is your value? So my value is in law, right? You've got laws that have not been written, not even been placed. I'll give you an example. When I came to the UAE, it was because my role was to come in and work in reinsurance on rocket launches and satellites. It's the biggest reinsurance company, well known across the world. What was missing in the UAE at that time was the space laws, right? So I was there offering my services and that's how I got to know the UAE Space Agency. And they appreciate it because it's a joint effort. It's never, oh, we know everything. In fact, it's far from that. And why? Because the space we knew 50 years ago and the space we know now are two different ball games. Because yeah. back then it was all run by states, heads of states, you know, the policy makers. Now, it's the entrepreneurs, it's the startups. I mean, looking at COVID-19 is a good example. You know, TikTok, I do not understand it, but it's huge business. Um, you know, Deliveroo and all these other takeaway companies, right, that's bouncing up, you know, com coming out from nowhere. They are also making huge profits. So good, you know, we, we have to thank all these millennials and these influencers and these, you know, entrepreneurs because they're creating products which we've never envisaged and it's actually making our lives easier. And that's where, and that's the way I think there's an, a window of opportunity for space startups because, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be traditional. In fact, I'll give you another idea. There was one guy who's an engineer and he's, his dream was to get his photo up in space as a selfie. He managed it. He somehow managed to latch a camera onto a satellite and to take a selfie. Now, he sent that back on Instagram. Obviously, everyone's liking it. But wait a second. In the same way that Instagram is this desire of people sharing photos. Well, I have an account. You have an account. Why don't we create that into a business opportunity? Now, I'm sure someone's already working on it. But what I'm trying to say is, as random as that, that's a business opportunity for marketing purposes, for fun, for entertainment, you name it. So you never know. So I would never say never, <laughs> never say no. Yeah. And so what do you need to, um, how can you get involved in any way, shape or form? You, I would always say go by the lowest hanging fruit. What do you have in terms of your own resources, your own contacts? You start with that and then you slowly branch out. You know, don't try and, you know, change the world in one step. But that's impossible, right? But if you do it step by step, then things will seem easier and easier for you. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Thank you so much, yeah. Helen. It really seems like now is the time and place. If you want to get involved in startups, especially in the space sector, yes. there's so much encouragement. It's branched out to so many different countries yes. that it's yeah. literally open to everybody's grasp, which yes. is fantastic. So thank you so much for that information. Um, I know that you do have a few videos that you'd like to show us in regards to one of the congresses and some of the information. So I'll post them up now and you can give us some information about it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. On behalf of Mohammed Marashid Space Center, I would like to thank the IM for selecting Dubai to host IAC 2020. Uh, we are honored and excited to host this Congress, and we believe that the 71st edition of the IAC will leave a lasting impression on the region and build up on previous successes. Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. yes. It's great, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So that video was about the International um, Astronautical Congress. And uh, this one is going to be postponed till next year, 2021. There will be um, an innovation zone, uh, which I'm 
you could say part of. Uh, I wear a few hats. Um, so I co-chair one of the space debris space operations and also the enterprise risk management, which is all about risk in businesses, but also for entrepreneurs. And that one, um, the innovation, so is where we're going to try and gather the world's, you know, startups, investors to come to one place. And this is where we want to see business happening. So if you're interested, keep your eyes posted and sealed um, for the IEC 2021. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And also, there's another video yeah. that you've provided for us in regards to the Moon Village Association. Yes. Can you yes. tell us a little yeah, bit about sure. that? Yeah, sure. So the Moon Village, Asso Moon Village Association is this concept of going back to the moon to stay. So in the past, where it's going back to the moon to explore, this is where it's different. So um, Professor Raibaldi, he's a former um, European Space Agency um, Expertise, expert, he's been with the industry a long time and our vice president is actually a former NASA and at one point I was also one of the interim board members um, and basically it's been very exciting. I've also tried to help the MVA or engage MVA to get um, entrepreneurs excited through pitch competitions, through poetry competitions. Um, and the MVA, as you see, is this notion of if we can create an ecosystem on Earth, why can't we replicate on the moon. So let's have a look and see at this video. So it's so interesting, isn't it? Amazing yeah. what's happening with technology at the moment. Yeah. 
and how it's impacting all of our lives each mm. day as we, we're speaking here at the moment. Yes, Definitely. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, I, um, I guess the film really, um, well, encapsulates the vision that, you know, everything's possible when you have a dream. And actually for me, when I speak to entrepreneurs, is it all starts up here. So if you have an idea, don't think, because 99% or eight, you know, this 8 to 90%, if you have a great idea, people usually think, oh, I can't do it because I'm either too thin, too fat, not smart enough, all these excuses, right? But I think when you watch something like this, which is so inspiring, which is you have a dream, go for it. I mean, this is it, right? Like, um, I mean, speaking honestly, even being a lawyer is not easy. So <laughs> we take it a step further and go, look, if it's going to be the difference between doing this and going to the moon, why not aim higher, right? And actually, that's a, a, what I call reverse psychology tactic I use on my entrepreneurs, because they all come to me and they go, oh, but it's so hard. And they're so this, and they start complaining. And I go, okay, let me ask you a question. Between trying to get investment, funding, doing this, working hard, to going to the moon, which one is harder? Hands down, it's going to the moon. So I think when you, you know, I, I love using uh, Tony Robbins, if you raise your standards, you will achieve more in life. So I hope this is inspiring. I hope this will engage more people. It doesn't have to be the moon, the space, space, sorry. But if it does help inspire you in your work, in your passions, in your dreams, then why not? Yeah, yeah. Most definitely. Thank you so much yeah, for that, Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody who's attended today. As said earlier, this has been facilitated by Hamdan Al Shamsi Lawyers and Legal Consultants with the support of the Youth Hub in Emirates Towers. And we're really grateful that Helen has spoken to us today and given us her ideas. Hopefully that she's inspired everybody. She's proven that obviously not even the sky is the limit, further than the sky is the limit, which is fantastic. Yeah. And every single dream is achievable. So thank you so much for joining us today.